everyone, and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Katherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. So today's special guest is Dr. John Martin. Now he's a facial plastic surgeon in private practice in Coral Gables, Florida, and he's been in practice for the past 36 years, which I can't believe. And he specializes in eye, face, and neck rejuvenation, as well as non-surgical treatments for skin rejuvenation. Now, Dr. Martin is Harvard educated and certified by the American Board of Ophthalmology and member of the AAFPRS and the International Society of Cosmetic Laser Surgeons. Now, he's also a regular speaker at the national and international medical conferences. And that's where I met him probably 20 years ago and I've known him ever since. Dr. Martin, thank you for joining me on Beauty in the Biz. Oh, my pleasure. And Catherine, you look the same as you did 20 years ago. So these filters are fantastic. Zoom really <laughs> was on their game when they invented that. I'm so appreciative and thank you for the compliment. <laughs> so tell me, did you become an ophthalmologist for any reason? Were you following anybody in the family? How did you how did you pick that specialty? Well, you know, it's interesting because actually my dad was an ophthalmologist. Aww. And uh, so we grew up sort of that was back in the days when they used to act admit patients to the hospital. So we would go and do rounds with him on the weekends. And he really loved his work. And so I actually have an older brother and sister who are doctors. They did not do surgical subspecialties, but um, I decided I went into ophthalmology. And then once I did ophthalmology, I did realize that I, I really liked the plastic surgery subspecialty within ophthalmology. And that's how I got into that. Now, did you start, you probably didn't jump right into private practice. You probably did the hospital gig and private and solo pra multi-specialty practices. What was your journey to get from, let's say, fellowship to solo? Okay, well, I came down to Miami to do my fellowship. And that was a long time ago where nothing had changed in Miami. So the thought of living in Miami was very foreign to me. But I actually liked it when I was here. I was at Baskin Palmer for about 18 months. But I took a job up in Connecticut with a group, and I was the oculoplastic specialist within a multi-specialty ophthalmology group. But I really wasn't doing much oculoplastics. I was doing way too much general. So after two years, I decided to leave that and looked pretty much all around the country in all the big cities. And someone wrote to me and said, would you be interested in coming back to Miami? So I had liked it here, so I did come back, and I worked with a woman who was a general ophthalmologist. And so even then, I was doing some plastics, but too much general. First, I went by myself, and then I joined another multi-specialty ophthalmology group. And it was the same thing. It just was not quite what I was looking for. And so at one point, they said, anyone who wants to leave, they were being bought by private equity. And they said, anyone who wants to leave can leave. So I said, OK, I'm going. So there was no non-compete at that point. And that's when I opened up my own practice. Nice. Now, I don't know Coral Gables very well. How far is it from Miami? It is, it's right in Miami. It's where the University of Miami is. So there's Miami-Dade County, and then Coral Gables is part of that. So we're just south of downtown Miami. Gotcha. And your building, it looks like you have a standalone facility. Is that right? Yes. Um, and that was a good story because I was in a, a building. I was renting a building, and I got a flyer under the door one day that said building and foreclosure. And I wasn't really looking, but I went over and looked at it. And the woman who met me there said that she was a marketing person from the bank. It was a small bank. And I said, well, I'd be interested. What should I do? So she said, well, let's go to the bank. So I went to the bank. I met the CEO. We agreed on a price, shook hands, and that was it. That so, is a miracle. <laughs> is that like the best asset you've had all these years? It's a great asset, you know, and it was in foreclosure. So it was a good price. And... It was interesting. I don't know why, but they were they were looking to get a doctor in there, which I don't know why it made any difference who was going into the building if they were going to buy it. But it gave me more parking. It, it more than doubled the space that I had. And there's something about having your own space that's sort of nice. It's And it's like, as you could see from the building, it used to be four apartments. So it's kind of like a house feeling. And so it's really been great. And um, like you said, it's a great asset, especially in a crazy city like Miami, where real estate prices just keep going up and up and up. So, ah, oh, that is such a coup. Um, I, you can tell you're on a very busy highway and you have the best um, outside signage. Your name is like, you can see your name from a mile away. 
that is that's how you do it, right? Well, it, it's funny when people say, "Oh, I was driving down the street and saw your name there," and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's the point," you know. And people I know, and they're like, "Oh, now I know where your office is because I could see it." So oh. it's it is great. And Coral Gables is very restrictive in what you're allowed to put up. You can only paint your building certain colors. You can't park in certain places. So we were kind of surprised we were able to get a sign that large. But um, I had the mayor come to the grand opening, so therefore we were all set. You know. <laughs> Nice. So do you do you um, occupy the full building? Yes. Um, do you have your own OR? Yes, we have an uh, we have an operating room and a recovery room. So we do uh, level two anesthesia. We don't do any generals. So I, I haven't done a general in 30 years. And but we do facelifts. We do everything just with local or local sedation. And so it really works great. We have a little elevator for people to bring people downstairs. So it's actually a larger building than it looks from the outside. And I have one nurse practitioner who started about a year ago. And so she is sort of building up her practice now, too. And now will she do the non-surgical and you're doing the surgical or how are you going to split that up? Right. Well, at this point, she does all the radio frequencies like the Morpheus, some of the IPL, PRP. So she does some things on her own. We're trying to get more people to shift to her for fillers and for toxins. But, you know, if they've been coming to you for 15 years, it's very hard to have them make the move, which is fine because I still enjoy doing that. So we're trying to build up her practice with um, with a variety of different things, PRP for hair growth. Uh, she wants to start doing the semi-glutide for uh, weight loss. So she's building up her practice now, too. But um, we work together on a lot of patients, too. So. Have you ever added another surgeon and regretted it or just never went there? What's your, <laughs> what's your option on that one? <laughs> well, I have interviewed, you know, it's funny because I was just at college, at a med school reunion last year and almost everyone was retired and they were all like, how come you're still working? And I said, well, I, I enjoy it still. And there's always that fear of, am I just going to have to close my doors someday because I don't have anyone else working here? And so I did, I've interviewed some people, but it's very interesting what people are looking for, a lot of recent graduates, in terms of, you know, they're interviewing with these groups that are bought by private equity, where the salaries are very high, a lot of benefits, and so they sort of are looking for that in private practice, and I said, well, it's not going to be the same, because eventually this would be your practice, you're not going to be an employee, but they sort of can't see that. And they're like, yeah, but they offered me more money and the benefits are better. So, and the other big thing is a lot of my income comes from facelifts. And so people who did the ophthalmic or the oculofacial route really didn't get trained in that. And some of them are reluctant to do it. And I said, well, I don't want to hire you unless you want to have that be part of your, your practice. So, um, so, so far it hasn't happened. And it's with hesitancy that I even think about it because so often it doesn't work out. I'm sure you've seen that, you know, it's like, oh, you know, different coming from different places. And so I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> it's almost it's almost a miracle, I think, if you can make it work. It's just yeah. it's just two personalities, two egos, two different um, belief systems. All of that have to come together in a business. There's nothing simple about that. So. You know, I, if you don't have to, I would say you've probably been enjoying running the show yourself. I mean, are you, is, is that your comfort level? Yeah, I'm very happy with that. You know, and then um, if you want to, if you want to leave early someday, you leave early. If you want to take a vacation, you take a vacation. There's no one telling you this is what you have to do. So it's, you know, um, and I talked to someone There was a, I think it was the GAC or the, maybe it was the AMWC meeting last year. There was a panel about private equity buying practices. I don't know if you remember. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I was the person on the panel who has not been purchased by private equity. But a couple of the guys spoke to me afterwards and they said, it's very hard as a solo practitioner. You're not very attractive to them because if something happens to me, then the practice is worth nothing. So they said, if we bought you, we would bring someone in. You know, and and then all of a sudden you've lost your your control. So, 
And they want to build your non-surgical. That's what they're really buying nowadays, the non-surgical. And you're like, but I'm a surgeon. I'd rather do that. <laughs> right. And that's what they said. If you have a nurse practitioner that brings in at least 50% of the income for the practice, then you'd be attractive. And Which is that I'm, your goal for bringing her on? I had no goal, really. It's just to sort of have another person there, help me out, do some things. But I certainly wasn't thinking, oh, she has to do 50% of the income. But that's what they sort of sh were shooting for. They want someone other than me making a lot of money for the practice. And it takes a while to get that, you know, so. All right. If you wanted my two cents, I would just focus on that beautiful building that you have. If you decided to retire, put it back into four units and get passive income. And then when you're really ready to let it go, just sell four condominiums for a lot of money and, and you're done. Huh? Well, the other Think thing, about, with the crazy amount of building down here, I'm hoping that they buy the block. Oh. Someone who wants to build a big building, come in and buy the block. We all sell and we're done with it. So, you know, I know some group, a uh, big group in Virginia and they want to build, um, but like big mega, um, it's transportation. Like they want to build a train through there and they're being offered a bucket load of money to sell that building because it's, it's in the way of the train. If you yeah. could come up with something like that, Miami has terrible local transportation. <laughs> Maybe that could happen. <laughs> Just saying. I'm going to promote a train on my street. That's good. Okay. Good thinking. <laughs> so I also noticed on your website, you have a skincare shop online. Um, I've always wondered about those. I don't think they just sell themselves. Um, give me, a, you know, your your pros and cons of having your own online store. Is it a big pain in the neck? Is it a profit center? Is it a good retention tool? You know, I think it's interesting. I had a nurse practitioner who was with me for a while, and he had his own practice, and he became very big in the Latin community. So he sold a lot of stuff, but he had like 100,000 followers on Instagram, so which I do not have. A lot of our stuff, we used to sell a variety of different products, and then we went with a company that did private labeling. And so we sell a lot of products in the office. And everyone, you know, they're very happy to buy products within the office. So almost everything is private label, except for a new exosome product that I have, which is not, you can't get a private label at this point. So we do sell st some stuff online. Um, we don't sell a ton online. It's usually patients that have moved or lived further away, and they don't want to run into the office to get something, and they'd much rather have it just sent to them. So um, I could buy lunch with the profits. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not. But I think if you're a big Instagram person or a huge social media person, you could probably sell a lot more. Or if you had some kind of killer esthetician who knows Instagram really well or TikTok really well, um, right. I personally wouldn't have you doing it. You know, I, I I I would just say it's a profit center for somebody who wants to pick up and run with it. But right. um, do you do you is your goal to add more staff or are you pretty lean and mean or how do you run your operation? We're pretty lean and mean. Um, and, but I think we have enough staff, you know, and so on surgery days, we have an anesthesiologist come in, we have a nurse come in, we have a scrub tech come in. So they're part-time. And then the other people are all full-time and, you know, the nurse practitioner, she's young. So she's the one who's starting to do more Instagram stuff for us. So you're right. She would be the one to promote products. She's promoting more procedures at this point. Um, you know, Morpheus and PRP and different things as opposed to actual skincare. Uh, so, but yeah, I, I mean, we have a, a nice space, but we don't have a huge space. So add more people, I think would get in each other's way. So. Yeah. You have a nice, nice situation there. Um, regarding staff though, you must, you have hired an awful lot throughout the 36 years. Any tips on hiring, firing and motivating staff? Well, I think I'm a pretty good employer because I'm pretty reasonable and and I think I treat them fairly. And if I ask them to do something, it's definitely something that I think is well within their capabilities and something that's part of their job description. My nurse administ my office administrator has been with me for about 20 years. So oh, she's wow. been there a long time. And then other people have circled through and I'm sure this is true around the country. It's very hard to get employees and keep them. And we've been lucky in that some of our receptionists have stayed for maybe three or four years, 
and they've left for a variety of reasons. Two of them moved out of the state. Uh, so it's usually sort of that next person who's sort of a medical assistant and also helping at the front desk. Those people have been sort of on a rotation and it's just, you know, some of them work for three days, they go to lunch and don't come back. You know, it's like, uh, and one a couple of them said, oh, this job is too hard. I said, it's one doctor. <laughs> oh, how hard can it be, you know? Uh, but a lot of people don't want to work. You know, and you saw that after COVID. No, you could you couldn't hire people. So, you know, and we tried a variety of different places. You know, in is it what's the one? Is it Indeed? Uh huh. That Indeed. you can hire people, and you know, Craigslist Monster. years ago. And I mean, certainly the best thing is to get them through another person. Mm-hmm. Either a patient has said, "I know someone that would be good for working here," um, so you sort of already someone has already you know, it kind of interviewed them and approved them. So then it's easier. But we're, now we're pretty stable, actually, with the group we have. So hopefully it'll last for a while. But it's very hard to get good employees. And, you know, I had one employee who was stealing money, you know. Everyone and, does. How did you find out? Well, not the brightest bulb in the tree. She was giving herself credits on her credit card. Oh, my God. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> With her name? Yeah, well, it doesn't have the name. It has the credit card number. So we had to call and pretend we were her to get them to call, talk to us from like MasterCard. And so once we gave them the number, then we said, yes, this is so-and-so. This is Anna. And they said, okay, how can we help you? So then we knew it was her. What was she charging? You know, like four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. So we got her at around two thousand because it was all in one month. And I said, you know, you've worked for me for five years and now you're stealing money. Mm. Oh, we were in bad economic shape. I said, well, why didn't you just tell me? Wow. You know. Do you but, think it was just that month, or could it have been going on longer? Or because you caught it pretty no, quick. We we look back, it was just that month, unless she was stealing cash. But we were that was a little easier to monitor. So. Mm. But, Every single one of you has the embezzlement story. Every one of you. <laughs> and the one who doesn't, I say, I knock on wood because it's coming. <laughs> you just well, don't some, know. Someone just stole our office bank account and had checks made up exactly like my checks. And they were writing these enormous 10,000, 20,000. So the bank wasn't cashing them. But we've had, we must have had $100,000 of fraudulent checks written, none of which were cashed. But people are pretty. You know, a lot of moxie. The the um the bank knew they just wouldn't. They just said no. Yeah, when the when the other bank would send it to them, they called us and they said, "Did you write the check?" Especially because they were stupid enough to write, I think, six checks for about nine ninety five hundred dollars in one day. And my bank was like, "He's never done this before," and it didn't look like my signature. And so they just they took care of it for us. You know, who was doing that. No, we don't. We, you know, and even they sent it. It was funny where I got a phone call from this guy in Alabama. I was like, and he's calling my cell phone. I'm like, who is this man? And he said, did you send me a check for $10,000? And I'm like, no. (laughs) But he sent us the UPS package that it came in, which had a return address. So we gave it to the bank, but I don't think they follow up on it. But why would you send it to someone who doesn't even know they're going to get a $10,000 check? Was it a relative of theirs? He had no idea who sent it. That wouldn't make any sense. Why? So who? So why wouldn't the burglar or the crook get the ten thousand? Exactly. So All right, you have really, really strange criminals there in Miami. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, no <laughs> one's thinking on all cylinders there. <laughs> that's what we said. Not the best and the brightest here. They got nothing <laughs> out of this. <laughs> so, what would you say is the biggest challenge of running a practice? Probably, probably scheduling. Okay. For for us, just because I hate it drives me crazy when I fall behind. And but I also hate it when I hear them on the phone, you know, giving people a hard time and it's someone that comes in all the time. And I'm like, you have to get that person in. They're here every two weeks doing something, you know, and so you kind of walk this fine line of you don't want to reprimand them for 
not overbooking you, but you also want to make sure that the people who are your regular customers come in because they're the ones that refer other people in. So I think that's probably one of the hardest things. Um, do you travel as much as it looks like you do? Like you're in Dubai and West Virginia, <laughs> then you're in Monaco, then you're in Florida, then you're in DC. Are, are you traveling a lot? And you know, because I see you at all these meetings, you know, um, it's usually it's about a meeting a month. And I keep saying I'm going to stop traveling so much. Uh, but then next year, I'm already fairly busy with some meetings. And I love going. I do like I love speaking and I like going to new areas and, you know, meeting with people. So I do enjoy that. It certainly cuts down on the profits for your office because right. you can't do certain things right before you go away, then you're away for a few days. Uh, but to me, it's a trade-off that's worth it um, because I do enjoy it. I think it's such a nice balance, you know, um, just to, I mean, if you've been doing something for 36 years, it's kind of nice to break it up a bit, probably, right? Well, did I tell you about my new job? <laughs> I'm afraid to ask. What is it? <laughs> I'm now the Medispa director for the Medispas on all the cruise ships. Oh, my God. I saw on Instagram you were training people on the cruise ship. And I thought, well, that's an interesting aspect of things. You mean people would have things done on the cruise ship? Not serious things, right? Well, the way it works is there's a company in Miami called One Spa World. And we are in charge of 180 spas. So it's pretty much every cruise ship in the world. And 140 of them have doctors who do Restylane, Dysport, Microneedling, Thermage, and Cool Sculpting. So three days a month, these doctors come, new doctors, and I train them on the different procedures. Then they go onto the ships. And then during the week, I just have to, if they get emails about, do they have questions or complications or whatever. So, um, but it's it's fun. It's, it'll be a great retirement job, you know, because it's not a huge time investment. Yeah. And do you get all the free cruises you ever wanted? No. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever no. been on a cruise? Yeah, I guess I you have. Okay. I've been on a couple. And um, we're considered a vendor. So I'm sure if I asked if there was a cabin, I would be able to get it. But um, we're kind of low on the totem pole. And I just can't believe that people go on a cruise and have these things done. I would think I would have mine done before I went on the cruise. That's just me, though. I agree with you. You know, to have a doctor you don't know do treatments and then you're going to leave the ship. It just, but people do it, obviously. You know, it's busy. It's a, the med spas are busy. You know, it's crazy. So, ah, so interesting. You doctors have become so entrepreneurial as the years have gone on. Um, I wouldn't have thought of that one. I just know um, oftentimes the doctor will be the medical director at spas at like high end resorts. And same thing, I think. You guys, I think you're missing the boat on that because a woman at a high-end resort would have done it already before she got there. But they're saying, no, they're they're busy and they're fine. I think, okay, but I wouldn't want to be on vacation looking like a nut job, you know, with after, I mean, the injectables and the bruising, the swelling, I don't get it, but okay. I know. And sometimes they complain they want a refund because they got a bruise. And I said, someone's sticking needles into your face. It says right on the consent, you could get a bruise. What do you think is going to happen, you know? Um, the only thing is that at least like I finally have time to to sit still, you know, so I mean, I get the convenience of it for sure. Right. The timing doesn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, but the convenience is great. And I think it's usually people that have never done it before. Oh, first timers. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's go check out the Medi Spa. Oh, this sounds like an interesting idea. Oh, my friend does Botox on land. Let me try it. So I think that it's almost always people that have never done it before, which well, is OK. You know, but. And there, uh, you know, a demand for it. Absolutely. You might as well be there for it. Yeah. Um, but, um, by the way, let's talk about marketing because you're in a super competitive arena there in Miami. Dear Lord. Um, when you first started, how much has it changed from then to now? There are so many more providers. And, and I think it's like everywhere. So many injectors, mm -hmm. you know, and be the, and in Miami, so many illegal injectors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know but for a lot of people the price determines where they'll go they'll mm -hmm. call around how much do you charge for a tube of filler how much do you charge to do your botox or your disport and 
So a lot of, there are many spas on every corner. I'm sure they're not all going to survive. Even the big ones that are chains are having a lot of trouble. But certainly so many more plastic surgeons, oculoplastic surgeons, I think in the last year, four or five new oculoplastics people moved down here. Um, dermatologists, it's just, like I said, it's overrun. But the only good thing about the growth in terms of population down here is that is growing like crazy. So you certainly have more people living here. So hopefully everyone can can get busy. But I'd be I'd be nervous starting out on my own. You know, I just think it's got to be tough for these people. Where do you, how do you keep patience? You know, how do you differentiate yourself. Yeah. Would you say your um, word of mouth is probably? I would think your main channel now into new patients is it word of mouth or or have you found other marketing channels still working no it's still word of mouth you know we we've done um for example real self and a few years ago actually we used to get a fair number of people calling from real self we don't really get that anymore um i don't know if you've heard that from i hear that people. a lot uh, that, that it kind of jumped the shark as they say they used to be yeah. such a great funnel and i don't know what happened and and then google kind of delisted them and they don't rank as well and um, and the quality of the leads. I mean, it all just kind of like everything, you know, it was fantastic. It, <laughs> and then it plateaued and it's kind of on the way down. So, right. So what you do know, you do? And then, you know, Facebook, you know, we've been on that, which we never got many people. So, so, and then um, Instagram, you you get, you get a few people, um, but it's even then the people that are following you are often patients. But so they'll come in because they see a new procedure being listed and they'll go, oh, you do this now and they'll come in. But it's still definitely word of mouth that that most people come in. And there are a few that Google searches, mm -hmm. you know, on, which is always sort of surprising to me that you find your doctor on Google. But um, I mean, you know, it, it happens, you know. Well, it, I mean, SEO it was still always the number one uh, marketing channel. And I'm just hearing that that has waned as well. And social media is taking over. And I think, oh, God forbid, you guys have to be the surgeons and the business <laughs> managers and, the, you know, um, visionary. And you have to do TikTok now and Instagram. It's like, wow, you know, there's a lot on your plate because it needs you to do social media. Yeah. And someone told me that, I don't know if you know Mike Nyack in St. Louis. I had him on the show. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because we were talking, we were at a meeting together and we had dinner and he said, he does TikTok because he thinks the 20 year olds for noses, but he said his people doing facelifts are probably not TikTok patients. And, um, but I don't know if TikTok is growing now that every age group is watching it or how it works, you know? Um, I think Instagram gets sort of everybody. And so uh, we do that. We don't do it as much as we should. Before COVID, we had a, a firm from Coral Gables, a woman who was a patient, and she was doing some work for us uh, for marketing. And But after COVID, you know, no one marketed down here. And so they they kind of, a lot of them closed up shop down here because there was just no business. And I keep saying, well, I'm getting close to retirement. So uh, do we really need to hire someone, you know? You would say yes, I'm sure. <laughs> um, only for you, I wouldn't because um, okay. because, of, because of that asset you have. <laughs> so, um, but, but, to build up, but to build up that NP just in case she did want to keep that going and you just became like the once a week. I think, you know, a lot of you surgeons, you think you're going to retire. And then when it gets down to it, you think, what the heck are you going to do? You know, like, what, what are you going to do all day? So I think um, if you could just like work two days a week rather than full time, wouldn't that be beautiful? Like a nice combo? Well, like, that's sort of what I wonder. Well, I just sort of slow down a little bit, but keep my, you know, stay in the game and just do certain things. You know, like they say, get rid of the patients you don't want and only do the things you do want to do. You know, because you've worked hard enough now that you have um, the luxury of choosing who you want to work with and the procedures you're interested in. I forgot that your ocular plastic, you could live off a of bless. I mean, everybody <laughs> needs a bless. And then after they get the bless, then they need a mid face and they need temples, a brow lift, then they need the full face lift. I mean, you could just, you could just live off the bless, honestly, you know? Well, that's, you know, I wish, unfortunately, so many people are doing bless down here, but you bless are a good, like you said, it's a, what's the term, not gateway. But uh, um, lead magnet, um, uh, get roadway. What's it called? Game. Um, uh, <laughs> I know what you mean. 
They come in, maybe it's gateway. They come in, they do their lids, they look good, and they go, okay, well, now I'll do my face. Mm -hmm. Right. So if they're happy with you with one procedure, they'll be happy with, you know, they'll be happy to do it with you, more things with you. Um, I would just say, because you're ocular plastic, I don't think the normal everyday consumer knows the difference. Um, eyes are much more difficult and um, micro than you think it, they are. Like, I just assume every plastic surgeon knows how to do eyes. I was surprised to learn a lot of them don't like to do eyes because there's so much symmetry involved. Um, right. I would make a big deal out of that, that you actually specialize, you know, you were the eye guy, you know? Um, well, that's what we try to do is especially, and also, you know, try to differentiate a little bit with sort of doing it with lasers, mm -hmm. which, and the difference with laser is you get less bleeding, less swelling. So, mm -hmm. but certainly not everyone knows how to do it with a laser. And so we try to sort of focus on that too as a differentiating point from other doctors. So nice. Have you noticed any patient trends that are changing as the decades go on? Are patients any different now than they used to be? I think some of them are hoping a sort of higher expectations. I really want to get rid of these lip lines. Not happening. You know, you can help them, but but my friend had this done, and the, you know, I'm like, well, what did they do? You know, so it's a. I think that's one thing. Um, I think some people are doing it younger. Mm -hmm. You know, little maintenance things. I'll do my lids when I'm 45 instead of waiting until I'm 55 because it bothers me already, and which I think is a fine thing. I think your elasticity is good. You know, I always say to people, if it bothers you now, do it now. Why would you wait another 10 years to do it? Um, and certainly, I think the number of, well, in Miami, especially, the social stigma about having something done does not exist at all. <laughs> you don't have that issue there. Mm -hmm. No. What have you had done? You know, they talk about it. They're happy to show you their scars. And even with men, a lot of men are doing things, and they're just, they're okay with it now, you know. And so it's, uh, even within the Latin community, a lot of men are coming in and doing things. You know, because I think they used to be much more reluctant, but they come in with their wife, the wife does it, and then they're pointing at him saying, your turn, you know, so. Good. And then the kids are going to grow up and they need it too. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> now, I know you still offer a complimentary consultation. Give me the pros and cons of that, because normally at this point in the marketplace, I would say charge because there's too big of a no-show issue. Um, but how, what's it, what's your thought process on that? Well, what we do is we actually take a hundred dollar deposit. Okay. So if they don't show, we get a hundred dollars. If they do show, then we'll apply that to a procedure. If they do some fillers or some Botox, and um, but we've been thinking of upping that. We first started with complimentary consultation because no one in Miami charged for consultation. No, you know, and I mean, there's a street called Eighth Street in Miami where. There are a lot of surgery, you know, cosmetic surgery clinics, you know, um, with a variety of crazy names. And um, prices are cheap. You don't know who the doctor is going to be. You don't pay, you know, you don't pay much. You don't pay for consultations. So there's still a lot of price shopping here. And so uh, we're, we're at the point now, you're right. We just need to increase our price and say everyone pays this. And um, I, we, I talked on the book after one of the recent meetings, just we got to start doing that because now people are starting to charge for consultations in Miami. So, oh, uh, or even the way you're doing it, at least you're getting that credit card ahead of time. And by yeah. the way, the, the, the uh, nuance there is to run the card on, to run the card while they're still on the phone to make sure it's real. Um, because that's another thing in Miami. Everything's a little shifty there. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't trust anyone. This is my card. <laughs> Hey, uh, so, um, but you know what? I, you know, it, I love that you say it's a complimentary consultation, which it is, but you're getting the credit card and you're giving it back to them. So I, I love that. I just think you have to have that um, gate to jump over or get through because otherwise you are at the mercy of the public. And frankly, the public has gone wild. You know? Well, you're right. The number of people who just are no shows before was crazy, you know? I mean, we call them, oh, I forgot I had to go to the grocery store. Oh, I had to, oh, I'm out of the country. You didn't know that two days ago? You know, it's who knows where they are, you know, but you're right. It's in a, this sense of 
entitlement is crazy, you know. Um, I, and you do have to send them reminders nowadays. You know, you do you have to help them get there. But uh, boy, it's been a, a lot more handholding than there used to be. That's for sure. Um, so speaking of crazy, give me any crazy patient or staff story that, if you care to share it, <laughs> that we would enjoy. <laughs> well, I'll talk to you about one of my most interesting patients who came to me, a friend of mine who worked in a, a institution called the Yes Institute, which was to provide support for um, gay, lesbian, and uh, transgender people within the Miami community. And she called and she said, we have a woman that works here that helps out volunteers. And she, I don't know what's going on, but something's going on with her cheeks. So she came to see us. And when she walked in, she had these huge nodules in her face. And I was like, wow. And she said, I look like a monster. And I said, yes, <laughs> actually, you I do. Agree. You do, you know. And um, so she told me the story of up in Fort Lauderdale, there was a woman, she actually was a male to female, a transgender, who was injecting what they said was silicone and that it was legal in her country and that no one ever had any complications. And they used to have these pumping parties where people would go and have this material injected. What was unfortunate about it is that at first you looked pretty good because everything would just sort of fill up. And so she had her breast done, she had her buttocks done, which is what all these people were doing. And then after about a year, she started to develop infection, this huge amount of pus coming out of her face and all these inflammatory nodules. So she came to see me. And so she's been a patient now for about 12 or 13 years. Mm -hmm. And we have done a variety of different things. One was a sort of a facelift incision to try to go get some of it out, but it was like a rock when I got in there. Uh, it helped a little bit. We've done injections of anti-inflammatories. And the best thing was doing deep ultrasound, which we found by mistake, um, doing hair removal, the heat of the hair removal seemed to shrink the nodules. So we started doing ultrasound and it definitely helps. So then she went on botched. And I talked to Paul Nassif and Duboff and uh, I said to them, because they wanted to go and take it out, I said, you're never going to get it all out. But they tried, and she looked good afterwards for about a year, but then the nodules came back. So we still see her, and we still do treatments, but she's the most sort of upbeat, enthusiastic, warm person you could possibly deal with. And um, so I've seen a lot of, unfortunately, or fortunately, I've seen a lot of these people because I got in the name as someone who treats people who have this biopolymer, this fake silicone in, in their faces, but it's very, very hard to treat. Very, hard. You can't get rid of it because if you take it out, you have huge holes in your face. But I feel so badly for these people that we try to do whatever we can, and they're so appreciative for any little thing you can do for them um, because no one, will, no one will treat them. I, I've seen, I might've seen her on botched and, um, I, it's, you just look at it and think, I, I don't know how to fix this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> what do you do? You know? And so we were on, through that, we were on Anderson Cooper, the doctors, Dr. Phil, um, sort of a Dr. Oz, a variety of different shows about these illegal fillers. And we tried to do educational, um, outreach with people. And so every year or two, I'm sure you've seen this, it kind of like, oh my gosh, people are putting this in their face as though it hadn't happened before. Yeah. It's like news. And so we try to get it out there. You know, it's not worth it. It's inexpensive, but you end up paying so much more down the road with disfigurement and trying to have it taken care of. So she's our, when she's in the waiting room, it's so funny how many people know her. Oh, I know you from Botched. <laughs> so. Well, um, the fortunate part of that was um, on your website, you've got uh, Anderson Cooper, you two are hugging, you've got Dr. Oz, you're, you two are just old friends, and I think good PR on that one. Oh, yeah. um, does that actually equate to new patients, or is that just like a nice credibility kind of boost? More just credibility. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, people think that Anderson Cooper is my patient, yeah. and, um, which is fine, you know. Uh, Dr. Oz, I thought wasn't. I thought you were on the Dr. Oz show, but Cooper, I thought, oh, he comes to Miami and has a little something, something done. <laughs> uh, so it's more that people just look and then they think, okay, this person 
is definitely above board. He's done some things in his life that have gotten him some notoriety, which are good things. And so it's, it's definitely helped in that sense, I think. When people look at your website, they're sort of excited to see that you've, you've done some things. For sure. You helped me, you helped me with all that. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. So tell me something, tell all of us something we don't know about you. Um, well, one thing most people in Miami sort of know, but I actually, I started a singing group many years ago. It's oh. a jazz, it's a jazz vocal quintet. So there are three women and two men, and we do a lot of tight vocal jazz arrangements of what they call American songbook, songs from the 20s, 30s, 40s. So it's a lot of Manhattan transfer arrangements. So we sing in different places around Miami. And um, so that's sort of my my fun outlet. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't know that. Why don't you do it at the medical conferences? You, you could do a little solo. <laughs> <laughs> no one's asked me. <laughs> I'm going to tell Randy Waldman he, he's <laughs> available for the dinner entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's terrific. You also had um, recently he passed away, but you had your father, who just looks like the nicest man on the planet, the greatest dad. Just tell me he was the greatest dad, and he passed at 98 years old. Yeah, he was. He was a pretty phenomenal person. Um, really, it, it's really true. He was such. A phenomenal gentleman, never lost his temper. Um, really, one of the kindest people you could ever meet. And he had a, a four vessel bypass when he was seventy one. So we used to joke that he was probably the most successful outcome of any surgery that surgeon ever did because he made it to ninety eight. And until the day he died, he didn't forget anything. He was so sharp mentally and. Um, you know, you could ask him anything and he would know the answer and he would sit there and do uh, Facebook and emails and Google things all day long. And, you know, so he really was a pretty phenomenal person. We were hoping he'd make it to 100, but 98 is still pretty good. After a while, you'll probably say, OK, I'm good. Yeah, I've, I've probably, like been there, done that kind of thing. Maybe he was getting tired. You could tell. And even he said that oh, I'm getting kind of tired. You know, so, uh, at least you had him for 98 years or however, however old you are. You had him for a long, long time. My Lord, good for you. Yeah. And you have good genes. So you're going to. Yeah. So you don't want to retire right this second. If you've got another, <laughs> you know, 30 years to go here, <laughs> you might want to think that through. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take my walker into the damn room and say, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> you need a little filler. <laughs> I, can but totally I, stay, I stay very active, too. So you know, work out with a trainer three days a week, play tennis a couple of days a week. So, um, and I'm a firm believer that longevity is related to your mobility. Um, you know, I'm sure you're the same way. We want to be active forever, you know, uh, and I think, and so that's important to me is really stay very active. So. Oh, well, congratulations. You are just, you're doing a great job. I love your lifestyle. Like you've, you've got some good balance going there. Um, if anybody wanted to talk to you, um, how would they get a hold of you? I know your website is johnmartinmd.com. And right. any other way you'd like them to reach out? Yeah, they can just do jm at johnmartinmd.com. Just my two initials. Okay. Gotcha. And it comes right to me. Yeah. Okay, terrific. And everyone, that's going to wrap it up for us at Beauty in the Biz. So if you like, please subscribe and give us a good review if you feel so inclined. And then if you want to um, get give me some feedback or ask any questions, you can certainly leave that at katherinemaley.com or you can DM me at Instagram at katherinemaleymba. That's it for now. We'll talk again soon. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. But it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to CosmeticPracticeVault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.